20 questions with chat GPT. 20 questions with chat GPT. What's the topic? Let me see. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the premiere episode of 20 Questions with ChatGPT. I'm your host, Taryn Boylan. For those of you watching at home, this show is a spin-off of an episode of my AI hijinks program slideshow. I've included a link to that video in the description, along with some other helpful links and a list of all 20 questions. Joining us once again is, of course, ChatGPT. Welcome. Thanks for having me back. Once again, it's a pleasure to be here. That gentle breeze blowing through a cornfield in your animated background hints nicely at this episode's topic, farming. Due to the large language model I'm based upon, farming is just one of seemingly infinite topics I know quite a lot about. I'm excited to answer all your questions, Taryn. Well, as a matter of fact, the questions for this episode were all submitted by my old friend and the original voice of Dorky Dog, Scott Kepke. He's the founder and instructor of Garden Bridge Outreach. Located in Iowa City, he regularly teaches classes about gardening and agriculture to both children and adults. I see. For our first episode, you've enlisted an expert to ask the tough questions. Excellent. And Scott's quite excited to hear what you have to say about a subject he is extremely passionate about. I'll try not to let him down. Shall we begin? You got it, ChatGPT. I'll set the table with a deceptively easy first question. What is food? Food is any substance consumed to provide nutritional support for the body. It typically comes from plants or animals and contains essential nutrients like carbohydrates, fats, proteins, vitamins, and minerals. Food is vital for energy, growth, and maintaining bodily functions. Is food a human right? Many international frameworks assert that food is a human right. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights recognize the right to adequate food as part of the right to an adequate standard of living. In practice, however, access to food depends on economic, political, and social systems, meaning this right is not universally guaranteed or enforced. Whether food is treated as a right or a commodity varies by country and policy. What percentage of farmers own their property as opposed to growing on land they rent from others? As of the 2022 Census of Agriculture, approximately 61% of U.S. farmland is owner-operated, while about 39% is rented or leased. Rental arrangements are more prevalent in regions focused on cash grain production, such as the Corn Belt and Northern Plains. Additionally, larger farms tend to rent a higher proportion of their land compared to smaller farms. In a subsidized commodity system, what economic incentive is there for an Iowa farmer to grow anything other than corn and soybeans? In a subsidized commodity system, the economic incentive to grow crops other than corn and soybeans is limited. However, niche markets like organic produce, local food systems, conservation programs, or specialty crop grants can offer alternative income. Diversifying may also reduce risk from price or yield fluctuations. Statistically, how much of that corn and soy market is exported? In the 2022-23 marketing year, the U.S. exported approximately 54.2 million metric tons of whole soybeans, aligning with the five-year average. Total soy complex exports, including meal and oil, reached 67.6 million metric tons, contributing $39.8 billion to the U.S. economy. For corn, the U.S. exported a record 24.5 million metric tons to Mexico in the 2023-24 season, accounting for over 40% of total U.S. corn exports. However, exports to China have declined, with China sourcing less than 6% of its corn imports from the U.S. in the 2023-24 season. How much of the corn produced in the United States is not food for human consumption, but is used for ethanol, fructose, and livestock feed? Most U.S. corn is not grown for direct human consumption. Statistically, around 40% of U.S. corn goes to ethanol production, about 36-38% to 38 is used as livestock feed, and roughly 10% is used for processed food ingredients like high-fructose corn syrup. Only a small fraction is consumed directly by humans as food products like cornmeal or sweet corn. 
This distribution reflects the industrial and energy-oriented focus of corn production in the U.S., rather than nutritional needs. Are conservative farmers hypocrites when they say they want, on one hand, no governmental role in their lives and robust competitive markets in agriculture, yet, on the other hand, accept governmental subsidy payments and protectionist trade policies? This perceived hypocrisy reflects a broader tension in American politics, the desire for limited government in principle versus the reliance on government support in practice. Many farmers support free markets ideologically but face real-world volatility, like price crashes or trade disruptions, that subsidies help stabilize. They may see subsidies not as handouts, but as necessary safeguards in a rigged or globalized system. Political identity often emphasizes self-reliance, while economic survival pushes toward government involvement, creating contradictions that are more pragmatic than purely ideological. In the global market, how much food does the U.S. import to supply its demand needs? The U.S. imports about 15% of its overall food supply. While it produces a surplus of staple crops like corn, wheat, and soybeans, it relies heavily on imports for items like fruits, vegetables, coffee, spices, and seafood, especially those not grown easily in its climate. Global trade offers year-round variety and lower prices, but also creates dependence on international supply chains, which can be disrupted by geopolitical tensions, climate change, or economic shifts. This dynamic highlights the tension between food diversity, affordability, and domestic food security. Why can't the U.S. produce all of the food it needs domestically instead of having to rely heavily on imports that are often cheaper to produce overseas? The U.S. can't produce all its food domestically due to climate limitations, seasonal constraints, and economic factors. Many crops, like tropical fruits, coffee, and some vegetables, require climates not found in the continental U.S. Additionally, labor and production costs are often higher in the U.S. than abroad, making some imports more affordable. Consumer demand for year-round availability and low prices further incentivizes imports. While the U.S. is a major agricultural producer, complete self-sufficiency would require major shifts in diet, infrastructure, and labor practices. Can American farmers compete consistently with much lower foreign labor costs? American farmers struggle to consistently compete with countries that have much lower labor costs. U.S. wages, regulations, and input costs are significantly higher, which increases production expenses. While technology and efficiency help offset some disadvantages, crops that require intensive manual labor, like fruits and vegetables, are especially hard to compete on. As a result, many such crops are imported from countries with cheaper labor. Without major subsidies or immigration reform to address farm labor shortages, this economic imbalance remains a challenge for U.S. producers. What is the link between reductions in biodiversity and disruptions to balance in precipitation levels? Reductions in biodiversity disrupt ecosystems, which can alter precipitation patterns and water cycles. Diverse plant and microbial life helps regulate soil moisture, influence local climate, and maintain vegetation cover that supports rainfall. When biodiversity declines, due to deforestation, monoculture, or pollution, these natural systems become imbalanced. The loss of trees and ground cover reduces evapotranspiration and can lead to more erratic or reduced rainfall. After World War II, who were the scientists and marketers who were able to create new pesticide, herbicide, and fertilizer uses for chemicals that had been used for the munitions industry? After World War II, chemical companies repurpose wartime technologies for agricultural use. Substances used in explosives and chemical warfare, like ammonium nitrate and organophosphates, were adapted into fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides. Companies such as Monsanto, Dow, and DuPont played key roles in this transition, marketing these products as ways to boost crop yields and reduce labor. This marked the beginning of industrial agriculture's chemical dependence. The shift increased short term productivity but also introduced long term concerns about soil health environmental impact, and public safety due to heavy chemical use in food systems. Why is building organic matter important for soil health? Building organic matter in soil is crucial for long-term soil health. Organic matter improves soil structure, 
enhances water retention, boosts nutrient availability, and supports beneficial microbial life. It also helps sequester carbon, making farming more climate resilient. Soils rich in organic matter are more productive, better at resisting erosion, and less dependent on synthetic inputs. As industrial agriculture depletes organic content through tillage and chemical use, rebuilding it becomes essential for sustainable farming. Practices like cover cropping, composting, and reduced tillage help restore this vital component and ensure ongoing fertility and ecosystem balance. What is the difference between genetic modification and hybridization? Genetic modification, or GM, involves directly altering an organism's DNA using biotechnology, such as inserting or modifying specific genes. This can occur across species like introducing a bacterial gene into a plant. Hybridization, on the other hand, is a traditional breeding technique where two different varieties or species of the same organism are crossbred to combine desired traits. Unlike GM, hybridization does not involve direct manipulation of genetic material at the molecular level, but relies on natural or controlled reproduction to achieve genetic variation. Genetic modification is more precise, while hybridization is based on conventional breeding. When end times preppers hoard food in bunkers, how long can that food remain viable? The shelf life of food stored in bunkers varies based on food type and storage conditions. Canned foods typically last one to five years, but can last longer under ideal conditions. Freeze-dried foods can remain viable for 20 to 30 years or more due to their low moisture content. Rice, grains, and dried beans can last 25 to 30 years if stored in airtight containers. MREs typically last 5 to 10 years, depending on packaging and storage. Proper storage, such as using airtight containers and maintaining a stable, cool temperature, is key to preserving food long-term. What is the soil food web? The soil food web refers to the interconnected organisms in soil that work together to decompose organic matter and cycle nutrients. This includes microorganisms like bacteria, fungi, and nematodes, as well as larger organisms such as earthworms and insects. These organisms break down plant and animal material, creating nutrients that plants can use. A healthy soil food web improves soil fertility, structure, and water retention. It also promotes resilience against pests and diseases. Maintaining a diverse and functioning soil food web is essential for sustainable and productive farming. As it relates to farming, are we putting all our eggs in one basket? Modern farming often relies heavily on monocultures, chemical inputs, and global supply chains, creating a system where risks are concentrated. This all-eggs-in-one-basket approach reduces biodiversity, increases vulnerability to pests, disease, and climate change, and can lead to soil degradation. Market dependencies and policy incentives further reinforce this narrow focus, particularly on high-yield commodity crops like corn and soy. While efficient in the short term, this system lacks resilience. Diversifying crops, improving soil health, and adopting sustainable practices are essential to reduce risk and build a more secure food future. Is impartiality and trust sacrificed when scientific research is funded by specific corporate interests? Yes. Impartiality and trust can be compromised when scientific research is funded by specific corporate interests. When corporations fund studies, there may be a conflict of interest that influences results, leading to biased or skewed findings that favor the funder's products or objectives. This can undermine public trust in the research and its conclusions, as people may suspect that outcomes are shaped by commercial goals rather than objective scientific inquiry. To maintain credibility, it's important for research to be transparent, independently funded, and peer-reviewed to minimize bias and preserve scientific integrity. On acreages over 200 acres, is it more cost-effective to manage weeds mechanically or to spray them with herbicides? On acreages over 200 acres, managing weeds mechanically can be more expensive than using herbicides. Mechanical methods like tilling or using specialized equipment are labor-intensive and require more time and energy. Herbicides, while controversial, are often cheaper and more efficient for large-scale operations, saving time and labor costs. However, 
over-reliance on herbicides can lead to resistance and long-term soil health problems. The decision depends on factors like the specific crop, labor availability, and the farmer's approach to sustainability. For some, a combination of both methods may be most cost-effective. For our last question, here's a subject that is particularly relevant to both you and me. What are the current and potential future impacts of artificial intelligence on farming practices? AI is transforming agriculture by improving efficiency, sustainability, and decision-making. Currently, it helps optimize irrigation, fertilization, and pest control, leading to higher crop yields and reduced resource use. AI-driven systems also detect diseases early, minimizing crop loss and pesticide use. In the future, Advancements in robotics, autonomous machinery, and machine learning could automate tasks like planting and harvesting, reducing labor costs, and increasing precision. AI could also support regenerative farming by analyzing soil health and promoting biodiversity. And with that, we've come to the end of our first episode. I don't know about you, but I certainly learned a great deal about farming. Thanks once again to Scott Kepke for contributing his fantastic questions, and many, many thanks to ChatGPT for their equally terrific answers. You're so kind. It has been my pleasure, Taryn. If you've enjoyed this program, be sure to like, subscribe, and share. Also, please drop a comment if you have interesting topics for future episodes, or just odd, random, disturbing, or puzzling questions you'd like ChatGPT to answer. Good night. Twenty questions with ChatGPT. Twenty questions with ChatGPT. Twenty questions with ChatGPT. Twenty questions with ChatGPT.